So um, what Dr. Boxmeyer was just um, talking with us about before break was perspective taking, right? So what's the, what's the moral of the story for that unit? What do we want kids to take home with them from that? One, one thing, one main thing. Okay, empathy's important, but what, what? Say it again. Right, don't assume. So the, the um, kind of a, in a variant of that is that it's sometimes hard to tell why people do what they're doing, right? So what we're the, for our purposes, um, we go through perspective taking primarily because of the attribution bias issue. So our main goal is to help kids uh, not act on their first assumption that somebody's out there. Perspective taking by itself is an important social skill and it includes empathy, you know, it includes other things. So that, that's good for the kids. But uh, in particular, the message we want kids to come away from is sometimes it's hard to tell. So that means you need to think about it and get more information and then um, before you act on it. Um, and so even when you're doing the tasks, um, one of the key things is to make sure that that's the moral of the story at the end of the task, that it's sometimes hard to tell. So if they're doing the, uh, let's say, the motive in the hat activity, and um, you all were, I guess, sort of good at figuring out what the motive was, kind of even, yeah. But it, it, and if, if you had a group where they were pretty good, like most of them were figuring it out, well, then unfortunately, you can't make them that point very well, right? So um, what you would then do the next time you redo it, uh, as uh, Carolyn was suggesting, um, uh, you would change it. So the one thing that I would do is, is at that point is, is to tell the person they only have one second to act out what they're doing. So they're giving off many fewer cues, much harder to tell, you know, so you, uh, but again, what you're trying, one of the main things you're trying to do is to get them to the point where they say, boy, sometimes it's hard to tell. Can't quite tell, right? Um, we're moving into social problem solving skills. Uh, how many of you do social problem solving skill training with kids? Social problem solving skill training? Is there anybody who doesn't? Some version? I would think everybody does. Uh. Okay, so um, the first step in uh, this model, and this would be true for most models of problem solving, is there's a focus on identifying what the problem is. And um, the reason why we've done perspective taking actually just prior to moving into this step is that it's actually linked to it. So to be able to define the problem clearly and well, uh, it helps if you actually understand as well as you can the other person's perspective and try to accurately understand their intention. So it's kind of built in, it's one element of, of uh, problem definition that we would talk about with the kids, we, and we would point out that carryover. So um, we present problem solving in a general way. Today we're going to talk about making good choices <clears throat> when you have problems with kids or other people in your life. So what's the definition of a problem? So, so this theme of good choices is going to continue to go throughout here. So that's where we're going. It's going to have certain steps, but our main thing is just that we're going to make good choices. Um, uh, you can make the point that uh, problems uh, are not always between people. Sometimes they're individual or group. And um, in fact, one thing um, that I do think it's helpful when you're doing uh, problem solving is when you get into this program, this part of it, it's called the PIC model, is um, to uh, have a problem that you yourself have run into on one of these days and kind of model for the kids what these steps would be. And so it doesn't have to be a, a big interpersonal problem where you just had a fight with your principal at school or something. I mean, you could do that one, but you don't have to. So it could be more just that, um, uh, you know, I was going home last night and I was hoping to finish uh, working on some uh, forms here from school and I uh, left them here. So uh, that, that was a problem. So then that 
it, so that was my problem. So what were my choices? And how, what were, what's the consequences of each of those? Choices? So you can take these individual problems and use them actually as an example for the kids. Um, when we're defining the problem, uh, so we're talking about perspective taking, uh, we're talking about how as we have the problem, we're also going to have some emotional reaction, typically. And that's usually a good indicator. It's like a barometer that you've uh, actually uh, run into a problem. You're going to have some emotional reaction of some sort. Um, and so we're going to ask kids about their emotions during this period of time. We ask for kids for examples uh, of some of the problems so we can kind of shape that. One of the um, um, key things to be careful of <clears throat> as you move into this section, and this can come up earlier, earlier sessions too, but especially here, is to be uh, wary of war stories that come out. So kids get into um, very elaborate stories of uh, uh, very antisocial things that have happened. And um, uh, instead of that serving as a good model for what you're going to do problem solving about, it can actually get this kind of deviant talk going. So you have to be careful with what they begin to talk about as examples. And if they bring up something that sounds like it's going to be too uh, big of an example to really work with or to talk about, then say, that, that's helpful, thank you, and let's go on, you know, get, get another example. So the model is... Um, Pretty straightforward. Uh, we have in its basic form, it's called what's well, called a pick model and has three steps. So it's problem identification and then choices and consequences. And um, the kids uh, do remember that rubric pick. So they're going to talk about how they're going to pick apart problems. Uh, they're going to pick the right choice. I use the word pick uh, in various ways. And there is a handout. Uh, that we can that we give them, and uh, so kind of verbally describes these choices, um, and uh, so I think it's helpful for them to have it. I think we want to talk it out though, so that it's real clear. So um, when I'm talk so that starts with problem identification, it moves into identifying choices, identifying consequences, and then there's a choose the best solution uh, after you've got all of that laid out. And we'll, talk through how all that's done in just a minute. Um, when we're um, thinking about problem identification, there's kind of four elements of it that are active in my mind that I want to communicate to kids uh, in, uh, as I'm illustrating what we're doing. One is the issue of perspective taking, that in order to understand the situation, I want to be clear as I can about why it is that I think that the other person did what they did. So I'll ask questions about that. I'll try to probe for that. Um, I'll, try, I'll remember the moral of the story from the last unit and say, sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, and see if that um, was a situation where maybe they're jumping to a conclusion that's not warranted. Um, I'm going to uh, ask kids about what their goal is in the situation. Uh, and that's a really important part of problem solving. So uh, if you're doing problem solving, you come up with a problem that you've run into. Uh, so uh, 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 I'm on the bus in the morning. Um, somebody's in my face um, um, kind of yelling at me. And I'm feeling disrespected and pretty upset. So, my, so in that situation, there's several things going on. One is my feeling, so my anger is there. It could be very high on my anger thermometer. Uh, so the bottom line is we know that in our first steps here, problem solving and practicing, practicing that that is not the situation we want to start with, actually. It's a real situation for the kid, but that's not where you want to go. So a second element of um, another element of uh, problem identification is um, uh, doing a behavioral analysis where you're going to back that particular problem that's told to you up. So you're going to back the problem up. You're going to back it down in time. So you're going to say, oh, boy, that sounds like that was pretty tough when he was yelling at you. What happened right before that? And what happened right before that? And what happened right before that? So um, in this example, it could be that I um, got on the bus, and I, I usually have a favorite seat that I like to go to. 
And um, today when I got on the bus, this guy was in the seat that I most prefer. And so I went over and uh, started uh, uh, talking to him, and telling him to get out of that seat. You know, that's my seat. And uh, so before he actually got upset with me and started really uh, demeaning me, I was antagonizing him, basically. I was doing some things because I wanted that seat, right? So if you keep backing it up, you get to the early germ of the problem, which is um, I want a place to sit on the bus that I uh, feel comfortable with, right? So that's potentially more solvable because you can ask kids how, where they're at in their anger thermometer at that point. And if it's low enough, then you would uh, uh, problem solve with them. The other part of the, this problem identification step, which is also, you can see in this example, is you want to go from actually the problem itself, so uh, somebody sitting in the seat that I prefer, right, to what is my goal. And you want to shape kids into talking in, in that problem situation into talking about what's the most relatively constructive goal that you can get out of them. Sometimes it's pretty hard. Uh, but um, So it might be that I can find um, a comfortable seat or I can find a seat uh, next to one of my friends or I can find a seat near the front of the bus or whatever it is. So you try to make that goal um, bigger than just I want that seat. So what is it about that seat that's, uh, that's important to the child? So if you have that, then the, your ability to do problem solving, to think of choices, is just much wider, right? If, if you're problem solving only about, I want that seat back, then your number of choices that are even feasible are, are, many, are many fewer. So you, wanna, you want it to have a wide open, you want it to have a... Um, as constructive as possible. Does this make sense? Yeah, we're talking about. So those are all things that are in your mind. Now, um, when we present this to the kids, we just say it's problem identification, right? So you're you're the tool that kind of want you want to infuse in some of these issues about perspective taking, about emotion, about goals, and about backing things up. So those are always in your mind, uh, and they're not. It's not. They're not going to tick it off. But this is the pick it apart part is uh, part of this behavioral analytic. Uh, part where you're going to take the problem that they tell you and you're going to ask, well, how often has it occurred? What situations has it happened? And then especially, what happened just before that problem occurred? And then before that, and then before that, cake down. Yep. Yep, that's it. Yep. Yep. So what you're going to do, your job is to kind of guide that. Because if you just ask them out of the gate, what's your goal? Mm, I don't know. You know so you, you have to kind of guide it as they go along. And, and again, the, guy, the goal, getting a good goal, gets easier once you back it up as far as you can. You know, because the, the problem with uh, going with the problem at its worst is that there are very few choices and very few goals. Uh, so somebody's already in my face yelling at me, well, uh, my goals are not many at that point, you know, especially if it goes to the next step where somebody's already pushed me. Then what am I, you know, my goal is to protect myself or save myself or whatever. So the earlier in the process, the better. So um, when we're uh, illustrating this process and then when we're through uh, discussion, through role plays, and then uh, through actually really working through problems with kids, both in the group and then in your brief individual sessions, uh, there's a handout uh, that's in the uh, workbook that you can use to kind of guide that with them. And amongst the things you're going to talk about is uh, in this handout is as you talk about the problem, what is my goal and how am I feeling? So the uh, problem could be, John pushes ahead of me in line at a kickball game. So, um, again, taking the behavioral analytic approach to it, you want the problem itself to be as specific as it can be, as concrete, as observable as it can be. And so that's pretty, uh, pretty concrete, right? He took my place, 
for the kickball game. So I'd say, okay, that part of it's uh, pretty good. That's okay. Uh, what is my goal? Okay. So I want my place back in line. Right. So how is that different than the, than the first, just the statement of the problem? So John pushes ahead of me in line in the kickball game. It's a lot easier for me to get into revenge. Right? To hurting him, doing something to him. Uh, I want my place back in line is more instrumental. It's about I want my place in line. Right? So it's, it's less about uh, how do I, that my goal is to be revengeful to him. So there's, um, so that goal is, is better than the problem statement, at least in terms of potentially getting um, uh, good choices out. How do I feel? I'm a little angry. So again, based on what we want, we go, yes, he's just a little angry. So he's not, he's not real angry yet. So this, this is one we can work with. And then we do brainstorming. And um, when we're first doing this with kids, we, I'm sure that you do this too when you're problem solving, is you try to do the brainstorming. So there's really tons of solutions coming out. And um, if you have time, you might want to go for eight or 10 solutions for each one because you're trying to model for the kids that in fact there are many, many different choices. Uh, remember yesterday we were talking about uh, categories of choices. So if a child is giving you eight choices, they're all direct action. You're going to try to make sure some of the other categories show up so help-seeking verbal assertion shows up. Um, I want to go with what the child or the group, because this can be done both at a child level or at a group level. I want to go with what they're generating. But uh, if some things are not in that list, then I'm going to insert them or suggest them. So one thing that I'm going to insert is if the range of choices are too narrow and I'm not getting things like verbal assertion strategies or help seeking. So if they're not there, I'm going to suggest, say, hmm, I wonder if, hmm, how about, you know, something like that, and see if the child would agree with me that they could go in there. Um, for kids that are really working with me, that are, uh, I think, engaged with me, they're, they're trying uh, pretty well, their goal sheets are not bad, <laughs> you know, haven't get, gotten suspended here lately, so they're moving along. Um, we get to this stage and we're doing this, uh, we might not hear kicking, right? because they're trying to be good. They know what I'm worried about, right? But in fact, for this task, obviously, we want that out there. We know that that's a thought in their mind, or they wouldn't be in my group, you know, or something like that. So we, we, we know that uh, negative strategies are uh, part of what's on their mind. And so if they haven't suggested it, or if the group hasn't suggested it, I'm going to suggest it. Say, how about, hmm, how about this? So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it in such a way that I'm encouraging them, but it needs to be on the table at that, at that moment. So at this step, it's actually, um, right, it's non-judgmental, right? It re really is. I mean, we're trying to just kind of lay it out there for kids. Uh, the biggest issue is we want the range to be pretty good. So that's, that's the main thing through here. Now, the next step, which is consequences, I think is a key step. And um, uh, my own goal uh, when I'm doing problem solving uh, with kids and we get to the point of trying to think about consequences, is to essentially do as much brainstorming around the consequences as we did for the solutions. Brainstorming is not just for solutions. Brainstorming is for consequences. And we want lots of consequences generated for each idea. We want uh, to think about short-term and long-term consequences. We want to think about positive and negative consequences. We want all that to be on the table because it really is in real life. So it's easy, I think, in going to the consequences to just have a consequence so that bad solutions have negative consequences, the good ones have positive. But that's not real life. You know, We know that and we want this to be, at this point, as real as it can be. So call him names. John might yell back and push. We will both get into trouble. That's kind of straightforward. Kicking, I would feel good. 
So why do kids engage in aggressive behavior unless it feels good, right? There, there's some level at which it meets a need for them. It works. It, it works in the moment. And so it needs to be on the table as a consequence. Um, John might kick back. That's negative. I will be suspended. That's negative. So a lot of times, in terms of the aggressive solution, the positive consequence or part of it is short term, and the more negative part is longer term. And you can make that point that, boy, right in the moment, that would feel pretty good. Sounds like maybe longer term, it might not be so good. Um, ask him to move back. So, going, oh, yeah, that's a verbal assertion. Yeah, I remember, I remember John said that was good. So, let's go for that. Um, John might move. Right. So this is another element, I think, in trying to get kids to talk about consequences is to not make this two rose-colored glasses. Like all you have to do is come up with a good choice and it's going to really work just like that. And I'm going to try to shape that. If kids come up with that and say, oh, yeah, that'll work. It's like, mm, all the time, you know, mm, do you think so? And you want this to be, you want this notion of might to be in there. And you want the notion that it's, there's a certain probability of it working. It's not going to be absolute, certain probability. And if I can understand under what circumstances it might work and under what circumstances it might not work, uh, I'm going to be more successful. So um, in this case, if I ask him to move back, what would be a circumstance where it may not work? So he might not move, but OK, what else? Right, so there could be a way that I do it, which is pretty nasty. So that would be nasty. What else? The other kid hates me, right? Uh, the other kid is somebody I just had a big argument with this morning. Okay, all those things. So the other kid could be stirred up. Those are things that are going to make it less likely that that's going to work, okay, even though it's a good idea. What might make it work? So the way in which I do it, and that's a real key. What else? What about if it's a friend? Okay, if it's a friend, or even if it's it, so, if probably best probability if it's a friend. Uh, if it's somebody, and we're both on the same soccer team, uh, not best friends, but at least we're around each other and tolerate each other. So there's some chance that that might work. That there's something outside of this moment of interaction where uh, we're going to be around each other again. So that increases probably. So that's what you're trying to do, is to get kids to think about, uh, to be more uh, thoughtful when they're trying to use good ideas, because good ideas don't always work. And we know that. Um, talk to the teacher. Uh, John might get into trouble. So maybe he'd get in trouble, maybe not. And then he'd be mad at me. So that's a case where actually the long-term consequence could actually be kind of bad for me. You know, not, not, you know, it really could, uh, so it's a good choice, but really bad long-term consequence for me. So, um, so is that clear, kind of how we would go through this? Do you, do you also consider uh, that John might not move when you're going through the topic? Oh, yeah, well, um, the fact that John might not move, yeah, you could, it, that could come up there, and then in, in a way that becomes another problem, too. So, you know, you can also uh, build in and say, okay, I tried what I did, and now I, he didn't move. Uh, now what am I going to do? So what's my backup solution? So uh, one of the things, uh, one of the examples that we talked about yesterday, the second, uh, when we were doing problem solving, the second child who had, kind of had a reasonable first choice, and then uh, I'm going to hit him, was the second choice. Do you remember that? Okay. So one of the um, other uh things to keep in mind as you're problem solving is a notion that uh, Meichenbaum uh, talked about years ago. And that's that um, in your, you, you have a hip pocket solution or a back pocket solution. So when your, your first idea, which might be to ask him to move back, doesn't work, what's your backup idea? So that's recognizing that for many kids, that's the point that they really get frustrated and they lose it and that it all falls apart. And so so you prepare them for that, right? It's like relapse prevention. Ah, 
some things are going to fail. And so what can you do in that moment? Um, and something actually like talk to the teacher can be a hip pocket solution. It's kind of a generic um, response that could be used ac across many different situations. So you could talk with them about that. So it's, as you're going through the problem solving process, that will come up, should come up, that my first idea won't work, and what else can I try? Uh, throughout this, you're trying to, at kind of a more meta level, you're encouraging kids to feel like they're in control, and you're encouraging kids to feel like they're resilient. Right? So that's where you'd like them to be. Yeah. Would you go into, well, what if John were bad at it? Oh, down here? In terms of creating another problem? Yeah, I could, I could see doing that. Now, the very first time, I actually wouldn't, though. You know, Because when you first get into this, like anything, you're, you're wanting this to be kind of a... Uh, crystal clear example of how to do it, right? So I'd, I'd keep it pretty straightforward and simple the first time. But the more that I would keep doing this over other problems, I would keep layering this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I can imagine a situation, though, where, you know, I was worried that this is a group where there's, um, you tend to get group contagion going quite a bit, you know, so I'm going to just be attentive to arousal level of the whole group. In that case, I think you would do the least arousing thing, which is, beginning to illustrate it around uh, kind of something personal and not social. Okay, other, other thoughts about just this step here. So considering consequences. So in the, in the program, um, as we go through this, so there's like a session for problem identification, a session for creating lots of choices, and a session for considering consequences. So it's not like we all have to do this all at one step, you know. Uh, it kind of builds on each other as you're moving along with the kids. And then, so you're at this point, and then um, you're at the point of making a decision. So you've gone through all the things. So what we would do then is to ask the child to think about the choices with the consequences that w the child has talked about. And think about how those choices get back to what their goal was. So what was the goal here? Remember? Get, back, get, get your place back in line. So you say, okay, let's think back. So which of these choices are most likely to get you back to that goal, taking into account the consequences as well? And then for the ones that do a really good job, you give them two pluses, one that gives not a really bad job, you know, negative. And if it's kind of in between, I'll give them one plus, right? So two pluses, one plus, uh, minus. So it's just a simple rating. And uh, so you'd go through each one of these and have them do that. And then your question comes in, right? <clears throat> so you're ready to come back. So that, then the question is, oh, okay, we've done all this, and um, the kid that I'm working with says, well, two pluses to kicking. I have thought it through, and this is what I want to do. I'm going to do two pluses. And um, so, there's, so one of the main things is, uh, I'm not going to just end it at that. If I think that um, that's as far as I'm going to get him in today's session, that, or her in today's session, uh, I'm going to end it by saying, well, you know, if it were me, and I was weighing all these things, the thing that would I would think would get me closest back to that goal would be whatever. So I'm going to insert myself. So what I don't want to do is to allow uh, overt deviancy training to occur here. And one form of deviancy training is if I am neutral or acquiesce with a negative choice of the child. So I don't want that to happen. <clears throat> so I want them to know uh, what it is that I would do. And I'll do it, you know, as non-hostile with the child as possible. Um, uh, I would also be intent then on trying to do problem solving in an individual session with that same child. because. Um, my own experience, actually, with most of the kids we work with, these are especially focusing on these fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade kids, is you can get kids in group who are kind of beginning to posture, you know, beginning to trying to um, uh, show their macho in front of all the other kids. And one way to do that is to stand up to me, you know, as the, as the therapist. Uh, but for most of those kids, even those kids, when I see them individually, it's not there. It's a very small percentage that are carrying that over to their individual contact with me, actually. And so with me, they kind of drop that part, uh, what they're doing in front of the group. And then I would try to do problem solving and see if they can do it 
you know, in a, in a way that's meaningful for them. With, with. So I'd try to do that quickly. And if, if they're still doing it, yeah, I'd come back to them again and say, well, if it was me, this is what, you know, I, I would do. And I'd try to, I'd keep pushing, I think, the negative consequences so that they're real clear about it. So one of the, one of the things, uh, another thing that, that I've, that pay, it means a lot more to me now than it ever used to be, was um, it's uh, the callous and emotional trait issue with these, with a lot of these kids. And one of the correlates of having that trait is you don't have fear. You're not afraid of negative consequences. And um, so one way that we've looked at that in our some lab tasks, we use something called the Iowa gambling task. And so kids have a computer screen in front of them. There are four decks of cards, and uh, they're given $2,000, you know, play money. And the goal of the game is to increase their money and, and draw cards. They, and there's no other, ex, no other direction. That's it. So they start, it's trial and error. They're going to try out and see what happens. And uh, unbeknownst to them, the two decks on the, on the left-hand side will have, for each card you draw, you get some uh, positive points. And for some cards, when you draw it, you also get points deducted. And unbeknownst to them, the two decks on the left have some really big payoff cards and some really, really big debit cards. Um, on the right-hand side, there's smaller payoff cards and smaller deduction cards. And if you actually just played the game out and just kept playing only the right-hand cards, you'd eventually be in plus. You'd, you'd, you'd come out on plus. And if you only played the left-hand cards, you would lose money. By the time you went through 100 trials, you know, it just would happen. So what's expected, and this is a task that was built for people who had certain kinds of brain lesions originally. And then has been used with uh, research on psychopathy and other things. Uh, the assumption here is that uh, when I'm drawing this really bad card that just deducted a whole wall of points from me, I have uh, an arousal. I'm negatively aroused in the moment. And so actually when you use the task, you are measuring things like skin conductance and heart rate. You know, did, did they have a spike of arousal? because something bad happened to me. And even though they can't, most kids can't explain why they've shifted over to the right-hand decks. It's kind of implicit. They can't really explain it. Uh, they've had this spike, and then they begin going, trying another deck where they don't have those spikes. Right? So, so it's really this internal uh, activation, kind of fear or whatever, arousal about that that drives it. Kids who have callous and emotional traits do horribly on this task, and they don't have arousal. Right? They do not have arousal. They don't, they don't get stirred up by it. So it really makes you think about what's happening to these kids. You know, it's not just that they're willful, and it's not just that they're mean. It's just that they don't have the same actual body reaction that the other kids do that guides them. So they're so it's harder for them to pick up on negative consequences. It's harder for these things to, to mean something to them. So it's our goal just to go over it and over again. Right? We, we can't make them hurt, <laughs> but we can repeat it over and over and over again, and then that helps them to, to begin to remember it as they go along. Does that, does that make sense? That's my goal, It's just to try to remind them about that. Kind of have to sit down here because I need my little form here, which is the this is the sheet that comes out of the thing. So it's got the problem solving worksheet here. So it's got the steps that I I work through. Um, uh, okay, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks we've been talking about problem solving and how to make good decisions. You remember? Yeah. Yeah, and we talked about the pick model. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You remember what the steps were in the pick model that you worked on? Um, I don't know. Problems. Uh huh. What else? That's good. Um, looking for stuff. Uh huh. So PI would stand for problem. Problem identification. identification. <laughs> That's right. You got it. You remember. And so PIC. What was that first C? Okay, choices, yeah, that's good. And then yet yeah, the second C. Uh, I don't know, 
a long word. Consequences. Right, consequences. And you know, we talked about the consequences are really kind of what happens next, right? That, that's really what it's meant to be. But it's a long word that, that's meant to be referred to that. So um, what we're going to do is try out how to use that pick model on something that's happened to you during this last week. Okay? So try to, try to think about something that's happened to you this past week. And um, the other thing to think about as you're doing that is, remember a few uh, weeks back we were talking about the anger thermometer? Mm -hmm. Can you remember that? And then we talked about how some things can happen to you and they're at the low end of the anger thermometer, kind of more like ones, twos, threes, somewhere down there. Yeah. So think, when you're thinking about something this past week, it should be like a one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. My teacher said I wasn't doing a good job on my homework. Okay, so my teacher said I wasn't doing a good job on my homework, right? Uh, and which way, what way weren't you doing a good job, according to your teacher? Um, I'm not sure. I think maybe I didn't finish it. Uh -huh. I didn't finish my homework. So you didn't finish it? Mm -hmm. And was it homework, all homework, or just... Math homework or reading homework? It was my math teacher. Uh -huh. So you didn't finish your math homework, right? Yeah. And then you went back into school the next day. What day was that, by the way, that you didn't finish? Mm, I didn't finish my math homework. That was on Monday. On Monday? Yeah. So you went back into school on Tuesday, and you went to math class, and then what happened? And then at the end of the class, the teacher just said that I didn't get to do a good job and I saw my paper. Mm -hmm. And she circled in red marker. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So she gave you some feedback, huh? She, she, had, she was concerned about that. Okay, so Monday night. So um, uh, you ride the bus home? Yep. Okay, so you got home on the bus. Uh, you had your backpack with you? Okay. Did you have your your uh, assignment list for homework for that night in your backpack? I think so. I can't remember. Do you have your worksheet for your math homework in the back in the backpack? I think so. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so uh, so you're not sure about it. So do you do you think you probably had it or not? Just out of curiosity. I definitely had my work. Okay. So you had your worksheet in the backpack. Uh, did you take it out at all? Um, well, when my mom told me that it was time to do homework, I took it out. You did take it out? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then what happened? Um, and then I think something happened, and then I don't know what happened to it. Uh-huh. Something <laughs> happened, and then you don't know what happened to it. So, yeah. So, so the... Uh, so, so tell me, does that mean you couldn't find your worksheet, or it didn't well, get done, mom, or what, what What happened? Well, my mom told me it was homework time. I took it out, and then um, I didn't really want to do homework time. There was something, mm. you know, mm. my friends were outside, mm. and I wanted to play outside before it got dark. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe I probably left it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, you left it somewhere. <laughs> uh, did you start it? Um... The first, yeah, the first one okay. I did. Uh, if you were to finish it, how long would it have taken you, do you think? Well, math is really hard, so I think it would probably take me an hour. Okay, pretty pretty long time, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a long time. How long did you work on it, do you think? I just, I worked on it for about, I don't know, um, probably 10 minutes. Okay. So you had part of it done, and then, and then you left to go and went out and played with your friends, oh, yeah. did some stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you did. <laughs> okay, let me just stop here for a minute. So, so what I'm trying to do here to illustrate this is I'm trying to take the first problem. I actually could have just problem solved about getting your work done and that kind of stuff. I could have started there. But um, what I'm trying to do is to back it up a little bit, right? I'm trying to go back to an earlier step. And so I now have a somewhat clear idea that uh, the problem is that something got started didn't get finished, right? And it, and the problem was the problem wasn't that uh, 
to them if I forgot to bring it home. I know that now, right? Because that would be a different problem to work on. So I know it's that. I know it's that it's at home, got started, but didn't finish. So that's what I'm going to now try to try to work on a little bit. Right? Um, remember, you know, when I when I the direction I'm going here is that we're keeping the anger thermometer at a one, two, or three, right? So, so even if it's antisocial, and if you keep if you ramp it up, I'm going to remind you about that and take you back down. So that so I'm going to work at that. Even if the kids try to bring it up, I'm going to bring it down. The reason why is, you know, I'm assuming this is one of the very first times I'm doing it with the kids, and I'm trying to illustrate it, right? So I want it to be uh, doable, solvable. I want them to come out of it sort of seeing what the steps are and all that kind of thing. So I, I'm not going to go for the very worst. The kids might want to take me there, which is your point, but I'm going to keep trying to come back down to something that's solvable at the, at the first, at the beginning. Uh, so why don't we keep this, but you can add in a little more sass if you want to okay. or something. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, so you started your math homework at home uh, after you came home on the bus, and then uh, you got about 10 minutes worth done, and then um, you went out in the neighborhood and hung out with your friends and did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you don't remember after that what happened to your sheet. It was it just disappeared somewhere, right? Yep. Okay. So when you got to school the next day, you didn't have it? Um, I did have it. I, I found it eventually, but it was too late for me to do my homework then. I found it. My mom always asked me in the morning. She always bugged me continuously. Mm -hmm. You have all your stuff. You have all your homework. Yeah. And then. So then you she, found it. She found it. Yeah. And then she gave it to me. Yeah. So I didn't have time though. Yep. To finish it. Okay. So, um, okay. So, um, let's say that the one of the problems, you had several problems here in this situation, it sounds like, but let's say the problem was that um, you're at home and you didn't um, finish your, your worksheet mm -hmm. at that moment, right? right? You did not finish the worksheet. Mm -hmm. what, what could be one of your goals at that time? Finish my worksheet. Okay, so a goal could be to finish your worksheet, mm -hmm. okay? But I don't really like that goal. Okay. You have another goal. Well, because then I wouldn't have gotten to play outside. Okay. Well, I tell you what. So there's different goals. So another goal would be you want to go outside, right? So that's a different goal. But, but when we do this, we can only stick with one goal. We'll come back to your getting to go outside as an issue, though. Okay. So the goal would be to finish the worksheet um, that we're going to talk about here. And then we know there's another goal about getting to go outside. Um, uh, so if your goal was to finish the worksheet, if that's your goal, what are your choices? What are, and I want like a bunch of choices. Choices? I can only think of one. What it? To finish my worksheet. Uh huh. To finish it. Yeah. And how? What does that mean? That means that I just have to do it. Okay. So you just sit there and do it all at one time. I guess. You always do all your homework all at one time? No. Sometimes I have, you know, sometimes if I lose the paper, I have to finish it um, on the bus or something. If I'm rushing in the morning. Uh -huh. Then I won't do it all at once. So is it possible that one solution is finishing the worksheet all at one time? Maybe another is finishing the worksheet a couple, you, you know, taking 30 minutes to do it, 30 minutes to do it, something like that. Maybe. So break it up. What's, a, what's another choice? These are just choices. Okay. Um, maybe ask my teacher to um, give me a shorter worksheet so it doesn't take me that long. <laughs> okay. It's really not fair. Okay. Uh, ask the teacher for a shorter worksheet because it really feels like it's not fair. Okay. What else? Mm, maybe. Um, Maybe I could do the worksheet with my friends outside, so I get to be outside. So are your friends in the same class? No. <laughs> Already? So that's, an, that's another choice, okay. <laughs> what, what's another choice? Um, maybe ask my mom to see if she will help me do it faster. Okay. Alrighty. And what's another choice? Another one? Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know. Ask 
my dad to help me do the whole thing. Okay. One more? One more idea? brother to just do the work for me and I'll give him like $5 or something. <laughs> okay. So you could ask your older brother. How, how much older is he, by the way? I'm two years older. Uh-huh. Is he good at math? Um, probably good at my math because it's probably easy for him. Uh-huh. Uh, so those are really good. You've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you got seven ideas that we that we've talked about. So that's really great. I mean, you really have thought of a lot of different things that you can do. I guess there are a few other things you could have done. Like you could have. Um, it's possible you might have thought, well, I'm just going to wad up the the worksheet and throw it in the trash can. Would that be a choice that somebody could do? Yeah, somebody could do that. Okay. Then they wouldn't get credit for. It. But they, but they could do that, right? Yeah. All righty. Um, okay, well, let's talk through some of these. And so for the purposes here, I'm not going to actually do all eight of these. This will we'll be here a long time. So I'm going to pick out a few of these. But um, So um, finishing the worksheet all at one time. So that means that you came home, got off the bus, and would spend... What time do you get off the bus? Um, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Okay, so from two to three, you'd be working on your worksheet. So what would happen next to you if you did that, if you worked like that? Um, then I would be able to play outside from three o'clock until dinner time. Okay. Be able to play outside from three to, when's your dinner usually? Seven. Three to seven, okay. Um, so that's one thing that could happen. What's another thing? get an A+. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Anything else that you can think of? Um, I probably wouldn't like it because I really hate math and I don't want to sit there and do it. Right. So it'd be kind of um, frustrating or something yeah. a little bit. So one thing that we were talking about <clears throat> up here was, you know, that your goal was to kind of work on this worksheet. Mm -hmm. So uh, thinking about that, where would this be on your on your anger thermometer? Mm, probably a two. Okay, so it'd be it'd be a two on the on the anger thermometer. So what if you decided not to do it all at one time, but <clears throat> you worked it out that you could do it part of it at one time, part of it at another time? Would I'd it probably forget to do the other half? Okay, so you'd forget it. Uh, oh yeah, the other half. That's what happened to me yesterday. Okay. I mean, on Monday. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, any other things that would happen next with that one? Um, I don't think so. What would happen when you go to school? Well, then if I handed it in and it was only half done, the same thing would happen again, where the teacher would say, we didn't do a good job. Oh, okay. Okay, so the teacher would notice that, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, what about if you ask the teacher for a shorter worksheet? That would be awesome. Uh-huh. <laughs> That'd be cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'd feel good about that? Yeah. Do you think you can ask my teacher? <laughs> <laughs> I, this is a problem you're working on here, right? <laughs> um, so would that have helped you with your homework on Monday night? That would, yeah, that would have been a really good idea if I asked her on Friday uh -huh. to give me uh -huh. shorter worksheet on Monday because I really want to go outside. So you would have had to ask uh, kind of a the day before it or yeah. something. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's let's say that that is a possibility that you could have asked for a short work, shorter worksheet the uh, day before. Mm -hmm. um, and then what works, what are the consequences of that? <clears throat> mm, well, then I would only take maybe 10, 15 minutes to finish the whole worksheet, and I would get to play outside the rest of the time. Okay. And um, what do you think the teacher would, how would the teacher respond to your request? That, um, like that's another consequence. Maybe if I asked really nicely and said, like, it's really hard for me, they, the teacher would be okay. Okay. 
Um, so if you asked really nicely. And if my mom asked. And if your mom asked. So how, what's a, how would you ask really nicely, by the way, I if say, I was your teacher? I would say, um, you know, Mrs. Smith, can I please, please have a shorter worksheet? It's really hard for me. Math is my most difficult subject, and I just can't finish it all. Okay. Have you tried that already with that teacher? Mm, no. Mm -hmm. She hates me. Uh-huh. She hates you. So um, what do you think... Um, she probably would let you have a shorter worksheet or not? I think if I really, if I maybe, maybe if my mom asked and came with me, I think that would be better. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, what's, let's talk about asking your mom to help you, because that was another one of your ideas that was more like your mom helping you do the worksheet. But yeah. let's say your mom, asking your mom to go to the teacher, right? So, um, what's the consequences of that? What what would happen next after you've asked your mom to go to the teacher? Well, I don't know if my mom would actually do it. Okay. She might want me to actually finish the whole thing. Okay. Uh, so, mom might not go see the teacher. Maybe, yeah. You think likely or not likely? Um, maybe a fifty percent. Okay, fifty percent. Sure that she wouldn't go yeah. for after. Okay, so let's just take some of these now. Okay, these are really you've really thought about some good ideas, and then you've really thought about them. Some of these are complicated little steps and stuff. But let's try to go back. And we talked about when we use the pick model uh, to make the final choice. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Mm, we have to pick. Best one. Uh -huh. How we do that? Mm, we look at it. Okay, we look at it. And do you remember anything else? Mm, we have to think about the consequences of the choices. Uh -huh. So we have to think about consequences. We have to think about how those choices get us back to what our goal was, which in this case was uh, to finish the worksheet, mm -hmm. right? Finish the worksheet that you were given. Yep. Uh, and then you were going to give. Uh, Two pluses, if it really gets you back there, one plus, if it's sort of, maybe, you don't know, could get you back there, and then a negative if it's not going to get you to the finishing the worksheet, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, finishing the worksheet all at one time. Um, two pluses. Two pluses, because it would get you back to that goal, right? Yeah. Um, break up the worksheet into two parts. One. Okay, one plus, because you get part of it, and at least the teacher, I guess, isn't as upset as mm -hmm. when you don't do anything. Um, ask the teacher for a shorter worksheet a day before. Uh, and let's say that first that's just you doing it without your mom. Okay. Um, hmm. That would be a plus for me. Yeah. So do you think it'll get back up to you getting your, getting to finish the worksheet? Yeah. You, so you think, so a plus, so uh, you're not sure if the teacher's going to do it, but you think maybe. Maybe. That's why it gets the plus, right? Yeah. Okay. And then um, the other thing was if you went to your mom and asked her to go to the teacher, um, will that help you get back to this goal of finishing the worksheet? Yeah, if the teacher says yes. Yeah, so okay. maybe just one plus. One plus. So um, you've got one thing that's got two pluses, you got three things that have one plus. So what would you choose, do you think, then, in this? Um, I guess I would have to choose two pluses. Okay. So in that case, you'd finish your worksheet all the time. Now, you told me at the beginning one of your goals was you wanted to get outside to be with your friends. Mm -hmm. Would that still allow you to get out there? Mm, if I did a really good job and finished it all at once, maybe I could go from three after three o'clock. Right. So you're... So kind of that goal would be kind of what happens right after the, the worksheet then. Right. Yep. I wouldn't be able to go right away. Yep, but later on you'd have some time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay, that makes sense. So once you've, if, if you've done that, you've gone to school the next day, um, teacher gives you a A plus, yeah. right? Where are you at on your anger thermometer then? Uh, 
have no anger. You're zero, zero down there, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, that'd be cool. Okay. Okay, well, let's stop here. So, um, thank you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but just, just actually, wait a minute. Um, so, um, let me ask you first, from your perspective, um, any things that you thought were sticky wickets, were hard, uh, were, or helped you to do it, or whatever? What kind of? Um, probably, I'm guessing, maybe I'm just keep thinking about kids who have ADHD too. I'm guessing uh, maybe kids will need a lot of guidance with the actual um, process uh-huh. of going through it and reminders about the different steps, steps. You know, mm-hmm. and the whole point of the step, especially right. thinking about having to go back and think about the goal. Because I think when you're having a long conversation, you might forget, oh yeah, what was my goal again? Uh, yep. <laughs> I could see your eyes when all of a sudden I said that. You know, oh yeah, that's right, there's a goal back there. Yep. So that's right. So they need reminders. So. One way to do this um, that works well is if you're in an office or a room where there's a whiteboard or something up there, then rather than even just having this here, you go ahead and you put it up there on the whiteboard. And then if, if it's up there, then either I'm going to write this stuff in or even you could write it in. You know, So then you have a real role in helping to write down what the choices are and the consequences and the whole thing. But then it's much more visible. You're more likely to remember it. Uh, if I just have this, then I could have done a better job probably of keeping it between us all the time. So you would have seen that, and I could have cued you to that. So, I, Or I could have given you a, your own copy, and I kept a copy, you know, some version like that. I think that's a good point, though. Uh, uh, other things? Um, I'm wondering if kids would have difficulty thinking about the different choices. You know, kids in this situation, that's kind of their impairment, right? So yep. maybe they'll have difficulty populating all those choices. And yep. does it end up being like a you have to, the, the person who's the therapist is really just telling the child rather than getting the Yeah, I, so if they came up with all of the, like the example yesterday, just some, it's all forms of direct action, which don't quite work with this problem, but, right. yeah, but they came up with just one thing. Uh, rather than trying to get all of those different types, I would just try to get one or two additional types mm-hmm. and um, hopefully one or two uh, constructive types. Mm-hmm. So the one thing I did add in was something that was a little more overtly aggressive or hostile right, uh, right. to yours because you didn't quite have that but um, but otherwise you did have a range in there yours was yours was pretty wide there okay why don't we just open it up here and people ask us questions either to or me here yeah um you do this in the group you just, yeah so do you have the other kids uh, make suggestions about how she might handle this do you, would you do that uh, i would but the very first uh, first time through I'm going to try to pick out the best person in the group that I think I can do this with, and I'm going to actually try to do it pretty much one to one. And have yeah. the other kids listen. Yeah, have the other kids listen in. But if I'm feeling like they're starting to get too active or whatever, then I'm going to pause and you know give, allow them to help generate solutions. And then as we go along, uh, I actually do want the, the problem solving to be group oriented because the advantage of that is that you've got a range of other possible choices that other people can think about that Tuma might not have, although in this case, you, know, you covered them pretty well, but, uh, but, um, but you could do that. And then in your one-to-one time, that's an opportunity to really kind of drill down and really go into it individually in more detail with the person. Just in terms of the back, you know, this is not a white middle class program, right? So the samples we worked with, so the sample the study where we had the 57 schools. Uh, we were um, in Birmingham, Alabama, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Our sample, uh, uh, what we have in that area is white and African-American families and kids. We were 80% African-American. So this program worked within that sample. And it uh, worked ethnically, it worked in schools. Some of the schools were really quite bad, very difficult. So I think it's, the issue becomes one of how to do exactly what you're saying, which is to adjust it to your particular school. And if you don't pay attention to that, then it won't work. 